The importance here is to recognize that the individual, the collective and the society are interdependent and interrelated and constantly co-creating a reality. And so we are taking part in this process of creations and what we do and say matters. And it's delusional to think, to believe otherwise. It's not recognizing a reality for what it is. What's up, everybody? I'm your host, Patrick Cook. Welcome to Being. Benjamin Castillo is the founder and director of New World Together. The organization is a think tank that advocates for a conscious evolutionary path towards sustainability by turning our global challenges into a collective opportunity for evolution toward a more conscious, intelligent, and rational world. The project's aim is to expose the commonalities and root causes of our interconnected global issues through an interdisciplinary approach and to offer individual, collective, and systemic solutions. This is a powerful and rich conversation which delves into incredibly important topics that affects us all and our future on this planet. If you're enjoying the content, please do subscribe to the show and get a new episode delivered directly to your device every Friday. And as always, I love hearing from you. So please do rate and review the episode on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or whichever platform you prefer. Also, I'm proud to announce that the show is now available on YouTube. And you can also follow us on our new Instagram page, at Being with Patrick Cook. For show notes and more information, head on over to being-podcast.com. Now, on with the show. Benjamin Castillo, welcome to Being. Thank you for being here, brother. Thank you for welcoming me, Patrick. Yes, I'm very, very excited about this conversation. This is the first time we've met, but I've sort of been following your content online for some time and resonating so deeply with the work that you're doing in the world. It's giving me chills just thinking about it right now. So uh, we've been in contact and finally found the time to connect. So I'm really excited to dive in and hear about what you are doing in the world, my brother. So um, I guess we should start right at the beginning for people who don't aren't familiar with your work. Um, you have an initiative called the New World Together, and you sent me an abstract of the research you're doing, uh, and it is just incredible, the articulation and how much it mirrors actually my mission and what I'm doing in the world. So uh, I have some hope that this could be a, the start of a beautiful collaboration, but at the very least, it'll be a fun conversation. So maybe we could start about um, what exactly is the New World Together? What is that initiative? So New World Together is a research and education platform. Okay. Um, and it's uh, constantly evolving. So what's really interesting is that we started as a you know, non-for-profit and uh, activist initiative, and we wanted to raise awareness about global issues and particularly the, the issues of unsustainability because we, you know, we are kind of... A, in a, in a, in a dangerous trajectory course, to say the least. <laughs> yes, we are. And so, and so doing this, this job, we realized that there was, I don't know, people were not able to receive the message that we had to share, you know, like mm -hmm. the audience will get kind of stones and uh, will nab itself when we try to share our, our, our content. Mm -hmm. And so we decided to find out, we search what was happening. We, we, we started to do research on what was going on with the people and why, why we, they couldn't digest what we were trying to share, the knowledge we were trying to share, with uh, an intuition that we were hitting at, at the core of what's tearing humanity apart. Mm. And so we slowly evolved from an activist group uh, with the willingness to you know, heal the world and, 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 and to, to a, a research and education platform to study what are the mechanisms that are driving our most unsustainable patterns and, and how we can actualize them. Mm. And so, so that's how we became uh, um, what we are today. Mm. Beautiful. So your abstract, which I read, uh, it breaks it down into sort of five categories, which I'll, I'll just read back to you as I understood them. Number one is a call for collective introspection and actualization. So maybe mm -hmm. um, personal development. Uh, number two, mm -hmm. healing and individual healing of individual and collective traumas, which I think mm -hmm. is 
incredibly important. I'm so glad you've landed on that. Number three is recognition uh, and conscious use of humanity's creative power. Uh, number four, acknowledging the paradigm shift into the Anthropocene epoch. So I'd love to hear more about that. And then number five is overcoming denial. So my hope was that we could sort of go through them in order and you can sort of unpack what each of them mean and what uh, are some practical tools people can be doing individually and to to heal the collective. So number one, the call for collective introspection and actualization. What does that mean? So basically what we are, we are in a situation in which the choices we make, the behavior we have is not sustainable. Mm. And that manifests in our reality in the form of, you know, an ecological emergency, uh, social inequalities, um, an impending economic crisis, geopolitical tensions, um, polarization, et cetera, et cetera. So it takes multiple forms. But it, if we look at the communities, it all go back to our own individual and collective choices. Mm. And so if we want to change this, make new choices, better choices that will allow us to become a sustainable species, we need to introspect. We need to look at what are we doing? What are we seeking for? What are we trying to manifest? What are we trying to achieve? And so what I'm talking about here is that the, the global crisis of sustainability in which we find ourselves is in fact a collective call for introspection. Mm. And what means a collective call for introspection is to look at what we are not conscious of what is happening below our level of awareness, mm. inside, not outside. Mm. Uh, what I've observed is that the biggest tendency right now on the surface of the globe at our current level of consciousness is to try to address externalities. Mm -hmm. So this is how, for example, we're going to have like, you know, some, some uh, I think it's Jeff Bezos, for example, is like, yeah, you know, I'm going to put $1 billion to fight climate change. Right. But like, we don't recognize that climate change is a symptom yes. of the crisis. Yes. not the crisis itself. It's right. just one among many symptoms because another symptom is deforestation. Another symptom is uh, um, overconsumption of resources. Another symptom is growing inequalities. Uh, another symptom is famines while, you know, uh, uh, in the meanwhile, millions of tons of food are being wasted on a daily basis. Mm. So like we have to look at this not as problem to fix, but as symptoms of the problem to fix. Mm. And where is the problem to fix is inside of us because yes. all these problems are a result of poor choice making at the collective level. Mm, yes, I totally agree. I think even a, a deeper level than that is choice making depends on making sense of the world. So being able to sense make as a collective and as individuals is even a, a step below the choice making. And the one, something that came up for me just when you were speaking is I totally agree. In introspection um, and actualization are completely necessary on the individual level and the, and the collective level. But what would be the motivator? Like convincing somebody like a Jeff Bezos <laughs> that he has to go inside and, and introspect you know what's what's the motivation okay so let's push let's imagine unsustainability pushed to the limits right yeah what do we have we have a civilizational collapse yeah a civilizational collapse global scale civilizational collapse that means like mass migration wars epidemics famines i mean mm. that's a shitty scenario right yeah and if such a scenario manifests what is the tendency of people right now they will look for you know somebody to blame they will mm. look for a scapegoat mm. who is going to be the scapegoat Mm. Right? Isn't this going to be all these people who are in power right now, all these billionaires who you know who are supposed to you know contribute to make the world a better place, but are too busy, you know, uh, um, uh, making more profits out of their profit? Mm. So they really have to understand that this is about their legacy, this is about their future. Because if we really push unsustainability to the limit, this is going to backfire. And no matter if they have, you know, a luxury bunker in, a, in some kind of paradisiac island, I mean, the consequences of a global collapse are unpredictable mm. and they will eat them back because these people have been on the spotlight as, you know, the leader, the, 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 those who were making the trends. And so people will be very happy to have them as scapegoat mm. uh, um, to turn against if really the ship hits the fan, mm. uh, the fan seriously. So uh, the motivator that they should have, survival, yeah. future. I mean, you know, this is, a, this is an existential threat. Yeah. And, and, and money is not going to be a guarantee of anything because a civilizational collapse means also a collapse of the financial system. Yeah. So nobody knows, you know, how it will turn out. But I am pretty sure that people will 
be very happy to have all these rich people as scapegoat to blame yeah. for, for that for that fiasco. Uh, what, what's, so, what, what's the good of having a scapegoat though if the, we have an uninhabitable planet? You know, so yeah, no, no, absolutely, it, absolutely. So the question that comes up for me is that this billionaire class, we're we're sort of assuming that they have a sense of empathy, or they have a sense of um, wanting the world to continue in the form that it is, much like you and I do. So why wouldn't somebody like Bill Gates or Jeff Bezos use their wealth to instead of pushing vaccines and trying to make a profit? Why wouldn't they? you know, go to eradicate hunger or to help climate change or whatever it might be that they could do, you know, to solve water uh, cleanliness in Africa. They could do that overnight, but they don't do it because it doesn't make profit. Right. Yes. So uh, I think we have to, 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 from my point of view, it's important to go a little bit deeper, which means on the unconscious mechanism. Yeah. Um, and of course I wouldn't, you know, be like, say that this is valid for everyone, but at least it's a tendency so what uh, what we've seen is that there's a lot of belief systems uh, yeah. that justify the constant uh, perpetuation of capital uh, um, accumulation. Mm. And notably, this belief that when you get rich, other people naturally benefit from it. You know, it's this, this narrative down. of the invisible end, etc. Right. And so um, for these people, actually... Um, recognizing that this is not working will be recognizing that they are living a lie and that they are not the hero that they want to see, mm -hmm. but that they are absolutely part of the problem and that their behavior and beliefs have been part of the problem too. Mm -hmm. So this is, you know, for somebody who's on the top uh, um, at the peak, this is a major shift, right? Yeah. Because you go from a belief system that tell you that you're a hero, you're a super successful guy to a realization that gets you into, damn, I'm actually part of the problem and my behavior and my belief are an existential threat to the survival of humanity. Mm, yes. That, that, that's an ego kill, right? I mean, somebody who has that realization go from, wow, I'm the best to I'm the worst. So that's not something that somebody can digest, you know, that, that, that for these people, I guess, that realization could be so damaging that they have unconscious defense mechanism yeah. of denial of escapism to not face that reality. Right. And let's not blame them because, you know, this denial mechanism, we all have them. So I yeah. think, I think, you know, it's, they, they are not the only one. Mm. Um, uh, we're almost jumping to the fifth, you know, uh, uh, research uh, yeah, about, right. about the, the denial. So <laughs> I don't okay. want, I don't want to expand on that, but yeah, but yeah, basically, well, uh, um, what we found is that the situation of unsustainability is so overwhelming and so challenging to our narrative, to our belief systems, that we are collectively in a state of denial, mm. not to face it. Yeah. And that overcoming this state of denial is probably the first step to becoming a sustainable species. Yeah. But it implies a huge transformation mm. of our worldview, our beliefs, and um, and, and that transformation implies uh, moments of discomfort, you know, moments mm, of having yes. to face our shadow, basically. Yes, our individual and collective shadow. And I think that's a, the yes. reason most people don't do this work is because it's painful and it's uncomfortable and it's unsavory. But I, I yes. completely um, agree that the, the path to... Uh, solving our solution or solving our problems has to start on the individual level and then echo outwards, ripple outwards. Um, but what I just what came up for me when you're talking right there is one of the reasons that keep people are stuck and feel paralyzed is that they feel powerless because you you think about these big global problems and they're like hyper objects. There's they're <laughs> way outside of us. We can only conceptualize them. We don't we don't see climate change with our with our own eyes we don't see thermonuclear war threat with our own eyes it's a concept and so having any power over controlling it or changing it feels well out of the realm of so we just do nothing it's like okay i'm just gonna you know use alcohol or netflix or whatever it is to to numb out because i feel powerless right and so yes. part of my mission and that's why i resonate so deeply with you is no each of us is incredibly powerful. And if you start taking uh, control and responsibility for your own shit, 
um, uh, investigating your shadow, investigating your limiting beliefs and starting to heal that stuff. That's how we change from the bottom up. So we don't need the power structures, the top down authorities to, to, to be spearheading this effort. We can do it from a bottom up, but it's going to take many of us doing this work. And I believe many of us are doing this work almost to the tipping point. Would you agree with that? Yes, and I think an increasing number because more and more people are realizing that you know, yeah. the trajectory in which we are on is not going anywhere. Yeah. What I would say about this is that what, what, we, what is really important to understand is that we're all part of this universe, right? And, mm. and in this universe, what we realize, and by the way, it's interesting that, that, that physics, even Newtonian physics did not recognize that, is that mm. everything is interdependent and interconnected. Totally. And the law of attraction is sufficient to recognize that. Right? This is how the universe works, right? Yeah. It, 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 and so because we are, we are, everything is interdependent and interconnected, it means everything we do has an impact. Yes. Everything we say. Uh, uh, and it's not because we cannot see the impact that it has because we don't have the sufficient level of consciousness and perception to do so, that it does not exist. Right. So the belief that we are powerless is actually a delusion. Yes. Totally. And, and it's probably come to, you know, a fear of accepting our responsibility, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and what it implies as human beings, which means that, wow, we need to be mindful about what we are doing. Mm. And, you know, we, we are growing in this culture, to, 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 to Western materialist, individualist, consumerist culture, has promoted a certain form of carelessness and apathy, you know? Yes. It's just about, um, uh, it, it is as if like, yeah, we are being told to not care about anything, that mm. the world doesn't make sense and that uh, that's the way it is and there's no need to ask a question and mm. that uh, religions are there if you really want to find some sense. <laughs> and so, you know, like, like, and so we, we haven't recognized yet the nature of reality. And as a result, we have this incapacity for sense making mm. and this feeling of powerlessness that makes yeah. us feel overwhelmed over something yeah. that's definitely over our head if we think as individuals, yeah. but completely achievable if we think in terms of collective and society. Mm. And so the importance here is to recognize that the individual, the collective, and the society are interdependent and interrelated yes. and constantly co-creating a reality. Mm. And so we are taking part in this process of creations and what we do and say matters. And it's delusional to think, to believe otherwise. It's mm. not recognizing what re re uh, reality for what it is. Yes, exactly. And I think you're hitting the nail on the head because we've been taught, especially in Western culture, that the individual pursuit, your benefit at profit at all costs of the individual, right? And that's a, uh, inherently an ego trait. It's an egotistic trait. And so we've crawled into the shell of the ego where we've separated ourselves from our common man, from nature, from the environment, from the universe, from source energy. And we don't, we, we're in this illusion that we're by ourselves and not interconnected. And so what we do doesn't matter or we're powerless. And so I completely agree that collective introspection and actualization of your personal power is fundamental to making changes in the world. So that's yes. amazing. Yes. So this brings us beautifully to number two. So healing of individual and collective traumas. What does that mean? So, okay. So basically, um, you know, we have this traditional belief that traumas is some kind of terrific experience, um, yes. you know, like a major accident or, or a rape or something like yeah. that. And, and so, and that, and so that therefore trauma is exclusive to the people who've been through this kind of experience. Yeah. And, 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 and this belief is, is, is to me really coming from, uh, a misunderstanding of what trauma is yeah. and that's how trauma is widespread in our, our society and in our world. Mm. So I'm going to redefine trauma here to you know, so, uh, a, a trauma is an experience in which we, we have to go through a lot of negative emotion, generally fear, and that is registered in our body as the presence of danger. You know, mm. it's like something is dangerous. You got to be careful about that. And we integrate this memory and, and, and the purpose of trauma is to perpetuate the survival instinct. Yes. Is to say, hey, you know, this is not safe. You gotta be, you gotta survive. You know? right. And so, and so, what I link with the survival instinct personally is the ego, right? Yeah. Is is whatever. So, 
So we all experience trauma, uh, and sometimes it can be very subtle thing, right? It can just be when you were a baby, you were crying, you were hungry, and you didn't hear your parents, and you felt that you were getting abandoned. You got the fear of being abandoned, and because you know instinctively that if you're not going to be taken care of, you're going to die, yeah. right? Yeah. And so that can already create a trauma. Oh, my God, if I'm not being listened, I might die. Right. So, so it can be very subtle things, but because we've not recognized them, we are not aware of them. And, and, and there's not only individual trauma, there's collective trauma. Mm -hmm. So what we did not recognize is that our ancestors and still us to a certain extent have been through a lot of collective traumas. So what is a collective trauma? A war is a collective trauma. Mm. A, 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 a pandemic is a collective trauma. A yes. famine is a collective trauma. Slavery is a collective trauma. And, and so collective traumas are distress, distressful events that affect an entire community, an entire group, an entire society, potentially the whole of humanity. Mm. The thing with that collective trauma is that they are often the most impactful because of their, you know, of their scale, because of their size. And yet they are the one who are ignored because they become normalized. Right. Their effects become integrated within society, within the cultures, within the collective belief systems, within the narratives of society. And so their impact become normalized and we become completely unaware of it. Mm. Another thing that is not well known is that traumas get transmitted from one generation to another. Yes. They, they are not, they, you know, it's not like, oh, the trauma of my parents, I did. No, they get transmitted. It's transmitted to at an unconscious level at this stage because we are not even aware that they exist. Mm -hmm. And so the impact of collective traumas is reflected in our society um, a lot. Uh, and we are not aware of it. Mm -hmm. So what we found out personally, and, you know, like, uh, yeah, is that right now humanity is in an unrecognized collective state of PTSD. Mm -hmm. And so, and so um, there's a lot of research, notably, that link trauma and addiction, right? Yes. So uh, I really invite people to look at the work of Gabor Mate. He's doing an excellent work on it. Beautiful work. What, what we found in our research is that actually we are in a state of collective addiction. Consumerism yeah. is yes. an addiction. Yes. You know? uh, um, um, and, and we have an addiction to our, to our cultures, to our religions. We have, religion to, we have an addiction to our individualist consumerist society we have an addiction to our nations uh, um, and to all the system that we've put in place at the collective level which means we don't even know how to operate without them we are we are and so and so what is needed in order to make sense of the situation and in order to overcome the challenges of our time is a recognition of the existence and impact of both individual and collective traumas. Mm. And, and so there's going to be a big need for, you know, therapies in many different forms. So I know this is also happening. Um, there, there's many change happening. The, the trauma awareness is becoming bigger. Um, there's also a psychedelic revolution that seems to be coming that will shift our understanding of mental health, etc. But we are still at an embryonic stage and yeah. far more is needed for us to make the transition toward mm. sustainability. Yes. We are in extraordinary times and facing unprecedented challenges. Never in history have we been so connected yet so divided at the same time. Now more than ever, there is a fundamental need and desire for us to come together in community and collaboration, to experience real and authentic connection with our fellow human beings, to be part of a tribe of people who are doing the challenging work of making sense of the world and their place in it, to have a safe space to be vulnerable and get the support we so desperately seek as we navigate the complexity of modern life. This is why I have created the Being Community, an exclusive online community for people who are doing the work of personal development, of awakening, of healing, of peeling back the layers of conditioning and unconscious programming and unleashing their full creative expression. This is for the people who have the courage to say yes to life and to becoming the best version of themselves for their own benefit and for the benefit of all. This private group 
offers all the functionality and benefits of a traditional Facebook group, but will be hosted away from social media and free from the watchful eyes of big tech. The group will feature live coaching calls, exclusive content and trainings, plus personalized guided meditations. At its essence, the Being community is about coming together to co-create the future that we all want to live in. If this resonates with you, go to being-community.com for more information and to reserve your spot. That's being-community.com. Now, back to the show. So what are some uh, some ways, uh, some practical ways that some people can recognize their own individual trauma and identify it? Because we, we can't we can't heal our trauma unless it becomes conscious, right? On an individual yes. level and a collective level. So yes. what are some, so the two things, what are some of the ways that it's reflected in society and some of our belief systems and our values and our behaviors? And then on an individual level, what's a way, what's some ways that people can recognize their own trauma? Great. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about collective traumas here. And to give structure to what I'm saying, I'm going to separate the collective traumas into three major types. Yeah, because okay. what we found is we have three major types of collective traumas. Okay. So we have the collective traumas linked with hostility. You know, all the traumas linked with past predation, past conflicts, uh, um, epidemics. So we've categorized as the trauma of hostility. Um, and generally what comes out of this trauma is the willingness to dominate and control, you know, mm. is, is, is the pattern of trying to control and how it manifests in our society, for example, is, you know, like the, the social construct manifested out of this willingness to control, uh, nations, you know, who have dominions over the, their territory and citizens and generally try for more, you know, are embedded into competition for, for yep. geopolitical power. Yep. So, so, uh, that would be the first type of trauma together with the pattern to you know dominate and control the okay. second uh, uh type of trauma that is very widespread is the trauma of scarcity right with our ancestors they've lived you know uh in situation of severe deprivation and so how it's being responded to is with the need to compulsively accumulate more and more right so there's a big link between greed and the trauma of scarcity right the thing that happens is that oh by the way uh, they tend to self-perpetuate, by the way, because right. of course, what happens if we suffer from trauma of scarcity, we are competing to accumulate resources and the result is poverty is being maintained, inequalities is widening, and therefore the trauma of scarcity is not resolved, is being perpetuated by the pattern that it triggers, right? Mm. So uh, uh, that's the second type of trauma. The third type of trauma is the trauma of separation. Mm. For a long time, those who were rejected by the group um, or who could be challenging authorities a bit too openly will get rejected, persecuted in ways that were life threatening. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, our ancestor did no joke. You know, you will, you will, you will get killed in the public space. Right. Yeah. So, uh, um, these traumas are deep rooted in the collective unconscious to which we are all part of. Yeah. And so if we want to, 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 to acknowledge this trauma, we simply have to be a bit introspective on the patterns that we developed. So for example, if I'm constantly see seeking for the need to be validated and I don't allow myself to say what I truly want to say, or if I, when I'm trying to speak from my heart, I have a shaky voice, you know, and, 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 and it's becoming really hard. I struggle to find my voice, which is very likely that, you know, the trauma of rejection, separation, whatever we call it, is impacting me at the moment. And so when I'm trying to speak my mind and to speak my truth, um, my fears activate. And, and um, so that, that's one point. See, mm -hmm. for example, I have any type of addiction to money, to power. If I cannot quit my job because I, although my job makes me feel miserable, although I know that it's you know, not who I'm supposed to be, or I know that it's making the world a world place, but I'm, 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 I'm too afraid to quit it because I'm like, how, how would I, how would I survive without my job? Right. Despite me, you know, despite having sometimes a lot of money in the bank account, that has been me for years, by the way, I'm talking about my personal experience. Yeah. Right? Many people. Like I, I was, yeah. I mean, I mean, yeah. I, I was making lots of money, but I was so afraid of, you know, leaving my job because of yeah. like, how I was going to survive. Yeah. And, and so that's probably because you are affected by the trauma of scarcity and the yeah. fear that goes with it. Right. Yeah. And then last but not least, if you realize, if you, as an individual, you realize that 
you are constantly seeking for control or quickly engage into territorial conflict or you know uh, um, tense argument. Uh, it is very likely that it is related to the uh, trauma of hostility, and basically we are unconsciously trying to achieve dominion over others, you know, and control. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's for you know I'm talking here about the most widespread traumas, yeah. those who yeah. are normalized. Um, other than that, how one can identify trauma is if you have any compulsive behavior that you know it's destructive to your life or to other people around you um it is i would say it is a guarantee that there is a trauma behind it mm. you know and so how do we overcome trauma well first i think the first the first thing is to not be too dramatic about it right to to be a uh, self-compassionate because we are all affected by it so having a trauma uh, is not being weird or suffering from something. Uh, no, it's just being human in the 21st century yeah. and actually being aware of being aware human, right? Yeah. Because I think those who think that they have resolved everything, um, and they, to me, they, are, they tend to be, <laughs> <laughs> in general, the most delusional, right? Yes. Um, and, and, so, and so then the change that we have is that we are living in a world in which therapies are increasing in numbers, um, in forms and so the, the 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 next is to be curious about meeting yourself and meeting your pain mm -hmm. and and starting to look around you what what are the 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 services the offers that are and and starting to get in touch with the people who are simply doing the work uh, you know entering in contact with these communities and starting your journey Mm -hmm. And and there's not one way to heal trauma. There's just so many ways. And what's important is not the best way. It's the way that works for you. Yes. Right. And that's the best way. And that's very subjective. So some you know method that can be really good for someone might just be average for somebody else. Yes. And so there, there's a little bit of experiment to have. And 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 what I see that there's more and more methodologies and and, and practices. Mm -hmm. But awareness is the first step. And we are far to be where we should be if we wanted to take the problem as it deserves to be taken. Mm. Beautiful articulation of, of trauma and its different forms. It's, uh, it's important to understand and to, to digest those so you can recognize when they're showing up in your life. Uh, and what you said about um, it, it, it takes a, a sense of courage to, to look at your own vulnerability because we've been taught, we've been programmed in the West, especially that vulnerability is weakness. Being in touch with your emotions equals weakness. And when we're in this scarcity, um, competitive capitalist society, any weakness is going to diminish our competitive advantage. And so that's we've been programmed not to look at our own trauma, or our own emotions, right? And so yes, the first step, yeah, the first step is, and this is part of my mission and what I do is create safe spaces so people can go into their uh, personal inquiry and and really discover what's going on in the inside. And it's because the first step is bringing to your awareness what is going on. And so it can be healed. It can be transmuted. It can be replaced, uh, whatever it needs to happen. And so I encourage anybody who's listening that vulnerability and stepping into that place, although it can be painful, it is the path to your personal freedom and it is the path to healing yourself and the world at the same time. So personal uh, development and healing trauma. Amazing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Excellent. Okay. This is amazing. Benjamin, I'm really enjoying this. Uh, I'm so excited about your mission and I think there's so much value in this. Let's continue. Number three okay. is uh, recognition and conscious use of humanity's, humanity's creative power. What does that mean? Wow. That's a big one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we are going to speak here about conscious evolution, right? And, and I'm, I'm going to explain what it is. Okay. Um, we humans have creative power that we've used unconsciously until now. And I'm going to speak about the most obvious ones that have not been recognized. Um, think about society, for example, as a start. Society is a human creation, right? Yes. But is it a conscious human creation? Mm. Not at this stage. Right. Mm. It's like this thing over there that we all follow and but we don't really understand how it's being created and we don't really understand how it's shaping us. Right. Mm. 
And that's for a reason is that our society right now, the foundation of it is, you know, thousands, it's, it's established on beliefs, it's established on narrative, it's established on understanding of reality that often is, if we trace back, thousands of years old, you right. know, centuries old. Yeah. And, and so um, that creation of humanity, and I would say it's a constant creation because tomorrow we stop nurturing society as it is, it disappears, it vanishes, it, it collapses, right? So we are constantly feeding it, constantly recreating it unconsciously. Mm. Right. And society finally is the result of, you know, our collective choices, our collective behaviors, everything we, we say, speak, etc. And so well, that's probably a bit big, but 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 we are talking about how humanity constantly creates society and unconsciously, and as a result, it's society that is shaping humanity, and humanity has no power over its creation. Mm. When if things were working, society will serve humanity. And, and to expand it, to self-realize it. But as it works right now, unconsciously, humanity serves society, are yes. almost slave to society and the system of power. Yes. That's because we have not yet recognized our, our creative power. I'm going to, to make it more tangible. I'm going to speak about at the individual level, our creative power at the individual level. When I created the foundation, you work together, the organization, I did not use them consciously. Right, I was just like, okay, in six years, like, okay, I gotta do something. Okay, let's create this, right. <laughs> right? And so I created New World Together. What I didn't know is what, or what I didn't know fully is that I was creating an entity that would have an identity that will evolve and that will shape me back. Mm. That will, you know, that will impact my thoughts, impact my behavior, impact my concept of identity, right? Mm. And so when we are creating social construct entities or institutions, et cetera, we're actually creating something outside of us that will determine who we are inside of ourselves. We are actually shaping ourselves. And that works you know, at, the, at the individual level and that works at the collective level. Mm. Our cultures, our narratives, our collective belief systems are creation of the mind but that will structure the mind, that will structure our perception of reality, that will structure the relationship we have with the world. And so when we are doing this unconsciously, which means mainly instinctively, driven by the need to survive, by fear, right. like our ancestors have done, we are completely losing our creative power or unaware of our creative power, and we end up losing that. Mm -hmm. We end up having a codependency with our creation and almost like being slave to our creation. Oh, wow. And so to, to overcome the challenge of our times, it's, it's really important to recognize that the society as it is right now is determined by primitive survival needs. You know, the need to dominate, the need to accumulate, the need to conform, right? Mm. And it's functioning on... on, on it, it has really primal mechanism into it that are unconscious. To recognize that this is something that we've inherited together with the collective belief, the narrative, and the cultures that are you know, around it, and that actually we can reshape all of that mm. to overcome the challenge of our times and to untap the best potential out of humanity is a game changer. Mm. But before we can realize that at the collective level, we need to realize that at the individual what is the best way to realize that is to experiment it ourselves. So, mm. for example, when you, Patrick, you created your uh, um, company, it is the same. Mm. Like, imagine if instead of that, you were afraid of, you know, not being successful and maybe not making money. And then you would be, OK, I'm just going to take like, you know, the fastest, best way to make money. Maybe you would yep. be a trader in a bank, right? <laughs> I and, almost and you was. Make, yeah, right, right. <laughs> and you will be a trader in a bank. And right now your mind will be full of, you know, what do I need to buy? When do I need to sell? How do yep. I maximize profit? Yep. And instead of being part of the, of the solution, you'll be part of the problem, yes, right? Totally. Not, and your thoughts will not be your thoughts. It will be the thought of the trading system yep. that, you are, that, you are, that, that you are part of. 100%. So I can, I can have personally experienced that. Uh, back then, I could observe it. I've, um, I used to work for the corporate world, right? Mm. And so before I started my corporate career, I already had this 
alternative ideas. You know, I could see that we were not heading in the right direction and that, that, that corporate interests were creating a lot of collateral damage and that basically all of it was not sustainable. But I didn't know, I didn't have much money at the time. I had to make money. So I choose, you know, I was recruited by a corporation and I started working there. And suddenly all my thought patterns changed. And, and all my belief system changed. And I remember one day I met an activist who told me about the damage that the corporation for which I was working for were doing to the local, you know, to the lo- to, 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 to people who are the most vulnerable. Mm. And I remember replying to her with the narrative of my, uh, my corporation, you know, and I, I had this, this conscious part of me was like, Ben, this is not you speaking right now. And which I repressed back then because just, you know, if I had recognized what was happening, I would have gone mad, right? Yeah. Been, Damn, you know, I'm, I'm being possessed by an external entity and I'm not, <laughs> I'm, I'm not owner of my mind anymore, right? Yeah. Have, so I repressed it's like, no, no, it's okay, right? So it's, it's the truth. So we are helping progress. It, it was all bullshit, but I believed it because my salary depended on it. Right. Aka, my survival depended on it according yes. to my belief, yes. right? And so... And so here I had lost my creative power. I lost my personality. I was slave to a corporate entity because I was on the survival mode with the belief that, okay, I need that salary to survive. Mm. And so attacking that corporate entity was like attacking me. Yes. I was, yes. I, it, 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 I was identified with it. Yeah. And so, and so we don't want to identify with the religions we create, the cultures we create, the social constructs we create, we want to make sure that they are the tools we shape to serve us Mm. and not they are the boss that shape us in order to serve them. Right. And so that's, 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 that's the path toward conscious evolution and conscious evolution as far as our research show is the only way for our species to become sustainable. Mm. Right. Because the alternative to that is to be remain the slave of our creation. Mm. And it's to do the bet of artificial intelligence. It's to say, okay, we are, we are, we are primitive animals who are destructive. Let's give or, or, you know, let's relate on artificial intelligence to solve our problems. And that will be really like the end, the loss for good of our creative powers. And not only this is very unlikely to be sustainable. But this will be like extremely dangerous for our ability to gain consciousness of what we could actually do and of the creative power that we possess as human beings. Mm. Yes. Wow. So much goodness in that response. Um, so deep, so deep is the conditioning being slave to the identity of the society and its institutions and being codependent on it. That is so prevalent. Um, and so many people I know myself included have been in that position where what I'm doing is not in my highest alignment. I can feel that it's not in highest alignment for myself and humanity, but there's this cognitive dissonance. I have to make money. There's a scarcity mindset. And so you just stay stuck in it, you know, and then you numb out. What I did was just drink alcohol because it was too painful to feel that dissonance until it got to a point where I cannot ignore this anymore. There's this yes. dissonance in, within me that um, it's too painful not to look at it now. And so what would you say to somebody who might be listening to this, who might be for the first time saying, oh my God, I re- relate to what Benjamin is saying. I'm in a corporate job that I know is not serving my interest or the interest of the entire world. How do I escape? What is it the first step? First step, don't blame yourself. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no guilt trip, no shame trip. It's all good. You know, like, yeah, uh, yeah it's not your fault. I mean... So the yeah. point is like, okay, the, no blame, no shame. It's all good. You know, we are all humans. Yeah. We all do our best. And if you have that realization, well, well done. You know, like, yes. like yes. consciousness popping out, welcome it. Like, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, and, and be nice with, you know, your ego might be tripping out. Like, whoa, whoa, what do I do now? Right. Yeah. So, and then, um, so there's so many ways, right? It, it, it's, there are different ways to deal with that. Ultimately, I mean, Again, corporations are human creation, right? And the corporation identity is shaped by the humans working in it. Yes. So, you know, 
you don't have to quit your job like, oh, okay, I'm going to quit this job. You could be like, okay, what can I do as conscious changes to make my corporation mm. more of service to humanity? Yes. Know? And there's so many ways to do so. So you, first of all, you don't even have to quit your job. Right. Then like, unless it's really make you feel miserable, there's nothing to do. But the first thing is that, oh, maybe I can do something to, you know, shift the culture of that corporation in the right direction, mm. being a bit less of a, you know, profit at all cost machine. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and, and then second is, um, uh, take your time to digest that because you don't want to, you know, like take a, a decision on, on, uh, on an emotional burst Yes. and, and, and look at, uh, what are the options available to you? Don't go back into denial, you know, don't, 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 don't let this disturbing feeling of cognitive dissonance take you back into denial, uh, because it's not going to work in the long term, right? Yeah. So anyway, you're going to, it's going to catch you back. Yeah. So accept reality as it is. Okay. Like we, we, um, we are part of a system that's dysfunctional and that needs to be transformed and that we can all play a part with it. Yeah. And then you can decide, you know, like for me, the two options, if you want to be part of the solution is either, you know, you engage into Whatever you can do to transform this entity from the inside, its culture, notably maybe by raising a little bit of awareness about, you know, the situation and, and the unsustainable paths we are on. Not that it's not in any corporation interest to not make the transition. Mm. Right. It's like, it's like unsustainability is, is deadly for everyone, yep. including successful corporations. So they're going to have to face this sooner or later. Mm. The sooner, the better. How are they going to face it? Because some people are going to raise the alarm. Yes. So it could be you. Some people are raising the alarm on the outside. And now some people can raise the alarm on the inside without being, you know, panic, without being negative, but simply using sense making. Okay. Yeah. This is a situation we are facing. Obviously, we are part of the problem. What can we do in order to be more part of the solution? Mm -hmm. You know? Uh, um, and, and engage in this conversation. If really they are not going anywhere, if, uh, if your corporation is definitely, uh, not able to evolve, then you can start another path. Mm. Ultimately, the journey is a journey to know yourself, right? Yes. It's a journey back in to know yourself, to know what, what you love to do. What are you gifted to do? And how is that going to match with what the world needs right now? Mm. And once you have that, you have, a, you, you have an idea of, you know, what, what effectively you can do. And it might take a bit of inner work. Mm. So, you know, um, um, be curious about who you are, about what you truly feel, about what you would like to say, but you don't dare say. And give yourself, you know, the time, give yourself the space to go into that journey. Mm. Yes. And, re and recognize your own creative power because many of us have been conditioned to believe that, oh, I'm not creative. I, I don't play an instrument or I don't paint. And they think that's the only manifestation of creativity. When in reality, we are creating all the time, whether we know it or not. And most of us are unconscious about our creation. And that's what manifests as the unconscious collective of these institutions and societies that are pushing us towards extinction. So beautiful, beautiful articulation. Yeah. And, and finding, I think what you're talking about is finding a sense of purpose, a sense, a sense of dharma, and then uh, expressing your unique creative gifts into the world because each of us has something to contribute and it's incredibly powerful and needed. And so, you know, doing the work to uncover what your purpose is, what your dharma is, and then creatively expressing it into the world for the benefit of yourself and for all at the same time is exactly how we can make massive changes and because we need them. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Beautiful. Oh my God. This is incredible. Uh, I'm going to keep moving. We could talk about that one all day, I think. But uh, number four is acknowledging the paradigm shift into the Anthropocene epoch. What does that mean? I l love this one. Okay, great. So yeah. the Anthropocene is, is a new ge geological era, okay. which scientists are still debating you know they are not well not all are, are agree to recognize it <laughs> but i think it is such a you know a no-brainer and i'm like oh my god you know like whoa, whoa. like yeah so i'm just gonna explain it very simply right okay beautiful um for hundreds of thousands of years our ancestors have been part of nature right mm. they they and they've been surviving in the wild uh with other species and they were in competition with you know pretty pretty dangerous animals uh, predators like you know uh, 
uh, tigers and stuff like this, uh, yeah. bears. And, and, and so humans were absolutely part of nature. Yeah. But because humans have this conscious ability, these powerful minds um, to come together and to create tools, um, um, science, uh, narratives, cultures, um, they, thanks to pro technological and cultural progress, they little by little started dominating the hearse. Right. Mm. And so statistics that is kind of mind blowing is like today, an estimated 98% of the biomass of the planet is either humans or their livestock. Oh, you wow. Know? Yeah. It's like, it's like, so, so, so we've literally came to dominate the surface of the globe. And yeah. the Anthropocene is here to, to speak about the era in which this nomination is transforming the natural environment and the climate. Mm. Right. And so what we are talking here is, is a non-noticed, a non-told paradigm shift. Mm. Because this is a complete game changer. Before the Anthropocene, we have to fight to dominate our environment, which is dangerous, right? Mm -hmm. We have to fight with rival tribes. We have to fight with predators. We have, you know, and, and, and life is a constant battle for survival. Yeah. Give you an idea, like in... In the Stone Age, which is, uh, I mean, what much, it, it, it's thousands of years, tens of thousands of years, right? Yeah. The, the Stone Age has lasted. Like yeah. the, the probability for one human to reach 20 years old was of less than 50%. Wow. Right? So, so I mean, survival was constant. Yeah. There was, so the threat of hostility, I'm back yeah. to, you yeah. see how it's aligned with the traumas, yeah, the yes. collective traumas. There was a yeah. threat of scarcity, notably uh, for those who migrate in part of the world where there's not a constant abundance of resources, but they had to learn to accumulate resources to survive. Mm. And of course, there was a threat of separation because uh, if you don't, if we didn't get, fin, if no attention from the parents or if persecution from the group, that will mean death, right? Mm. And so, so for most of our existence as Homo sapiens, we've been surviving in the wild, in the pre-Anthropocene era. Actually, the Anthropocene era is estimated to be 250 years old as a consequence of the Industrial Revolution. Okay. Interestingly enough, it's followed by what is called the Great Acceleration, which see an exponential increase of human activities and their impact that started in the 1950s, right? Yep. After the Second World War, like we started, you know, to have the atomic power, etc. Yeah. Um, and 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 so there's a real correlation between the entrance in the Anthropocene, the Great Acceleration, the overshoot of our planetary limits yep. that has started to happen in the 1970s. So overshoot of the planetary limits doesn't mean that uh, you know we are falling uh, out of the you know like it, it's just that we are our human impact is. Mm, superior to what the um, the bio capacity of the planet can sustainably um, take right. right that's the overshoot right? yeah and so the overshoot started first recorded around 20 years after the, the the great acceleration so there's a there's a correlation between all of this right yes. and so what we see is that right now the crisis of sustainability is due to the fact that we entered the anthropocene but which implies a change of behavior to, you know, start to behave as the steward of the planet that we've become, mm -hmm. start taking care of the garden instead of fighting over the turf. Mm. We have a need for that. And there's a conflict between the need for that and the primal survival instinct that we've inherited from hundreds of thousands of years of evolution, which was about fight to dominate, compete to accumulate, and 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 conform to to to, to be validated, mm. and so and so we have to recognize this new era. We have to recognize its implication, and we have to recognize the change of need that we have. We don't need to you know dominate our environment anymore. It's already done. Mm. All we are doing by perpetuating this need is fight each other, yeah. maintain a rivalry dynamic that is increasingly unsustainable with the increasing destructive power that we have yes 
due to yes. technological progress. We don't have to compete to accumulate more resources compulsively. We have to learn how to share them. Mm. We don't yeah. have to conform in order to be validated. We have to start being authentic and speaking our truth so that we can trigger the conscious change that needs to happen. Mm. And so there are new needs related to the era in which we have entered and to recognize them, we need to recognize that era, the Anthropocene yes. and the great acceleration in which yes. we are full on right now. Yes. So the way I understand it is uh, the Anthropocene is the era in which human beings are directly impacting our environment in a way that is pushing the planetary limits. And yes. frankly, I would argue that it goes back even further than that to maybe the agricultural revolution, because like you said, before that, we were living in symbiosis with nature and other animals. Like it, it, The more our, our capacity for hunting grew, maybe the tiger got a little bit. So we were in evolutionary balance. And then we started... Uh, cultivating crops and that gave us space and power to shift our energy and to develop our consciousness in beautiful ways but also there was a decoupling from the symbiosis with nature and the natural evolution that led to civilizations which are out of our evolutionary environment and led to traumas and the proliferation of these societies and institutions and now we've come to a place where we have exponential technology where you know it's it's it was said by one of my um one of my mentors Daniel Schmachtenberger I'm sure you're familiar with uh he said we have the the technology of gods but we don't have the love or wisdom of gods in order to be stewards of it and I think that's the problem where we're at right now uh, <laughs> yes. and that and that trajectory leads to extinction the other thing that came up for me is the idea of values you're talking about um not needing to accumulate more and be in competition but it's this programming into our society of values of you know okay well I need to put food on my table right now and so if there's a whale in the ocean that can um, is going to affect the the environment, but it's going to put food on my table. I'm going to do it because if I don't do it, the next guy is going to do it. You know, and so that whale is going to die anyway. It might as well be me, right? So everybody having that mentality, seven billion people, leads to you know extinction again, right? And yes. so it has to be a shared value. What do we value at the core? And it it can't yes. be just profit at all costs while externalizing the harm. We have to reinvent our values and and basically all of our institutions, governments, uh, monetary, economic, education, all of it has to be revamped from the bottom up. And why I resonate so deeply with your work, I completely agree that it has to start on the individual level, introspection, actualization, healing of trauma. These are things we can do as individuals to create a bottom-up cultural revolution that will change the systems from the bottom up by obsoleting the old ones, right? Rather than yes. trying to fight the old paradigm and, you know, wasting your energy. So absolutely beautiful. Do you have something to uh, Patrick, Yep. Yes. Um, I wanted to add something. You, you pointed at a, a systemic dysfunction that we have or society dysfunction. Great. Is What we see is a trauma-based compulsive pattern of yep. constantly accumulating more, you know, willing to have always more wealth. Yeah. And this should be sanctioned by the system, you know. There should be a, 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 you know, that's toxic, you know, that's like a drug addiction, you know, don't, don't that, that, that's damaging to society. Yeah. But as the system works right now, it tends to reward it. You know, right. th 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 those create the billionaires that we yeah. have. And plus with their, they are able to afford the brains to, you know, to the, the lobbying capacities, to in yeah. fact politics, decision makings. And so this is a major systemic dysfunction within totally. the reward system. It's like we have a trauma-based addictive behavior that is rewarded by the system instead of being pointed at, you know, and corrected. Mm. 100%, 100%. If you make $100 million and you're killing the environment, you go on the cover of Forbes. Yeah, you're, that's, that's how it's celebrated in our society. Yeah, so. and we don't even say about, we don't even speak about the, the fact no. that you're killing the run. I'm going to say, yeah. you, know, well, you know, like, uh, uh, I don't know, it could be uh, Coca-Cola, for example, you know, it's yeah. constantly, I've studied in a, in a, in a, in a business school. I mean, Coca-Cola was, was, is considered as the model of, of marketing, you know, yeah. like, oh, wow, amazing the, business. The gold uh, standard. But, no, I mean, bad yeah. for the environment, bad for health. Yeah. Uh, it's a poison to our world, yeah. but we look at it as, you know, a success story. 
Yeah, because we're, we're, opti- we're optimizing for that one metric, the, the value of money and, and profit, right? And so from, from that perspective, yes, it's a success, but look at all the externalities, you know, and that, yes. that's unsustainable when done at scale. So beautiful. Okay, Benjamin, we are at the fifth and final uh, talking point, overcoming denial. What, what is this all about? <laughs> Wow. Facing <laughs> ourselves and our reality? A big one. <laughs> S- scary too. Scary. <laughs> yeah, that's scary because we're not used to it. And so I'm going to point, you know, you will see all of this relate to a lot of the subjects that we talked prior to this. Okay. So, you know, um, so let's talk about denial. So denial first, so let, let, let's define it. Okay. It's an unconscious um, defense mechanism in order to protect your psychological integrity. Okay. Right? Yeah. And so we all have that. Um, and so the aim is to protect ourselves from overwhelming feelings of shame, guilt, uh, of thoughts uh, that are disturbing. And so what I see with the collective crisis of sustainability, or the global crisis of sustainability, is that we are in a collective state of denial. Mm. Because facing it is bringing up everything that is dysfunctional in ourselves and all the feelings, all the thoughts that are associated with it. So it's more than most can digest. And so naturally, unconsciously, we enter into a collective state of denial, Mm. which is very important to recognize, right? Because indeed facing the eco side, facing, I mean, what has been happening when I mean, we it's a bit insane right if you think of it with consciousness and if you remove the lens of denial i mean we are basically destroying life on this planet to a point that it's becoming an existential threat mm-hmm. we have a society of abundance that let a huge amount of people in situation of deprivation mm-hmm. of you know a famine because we don't want to share our resources because we are too afraid, but it's contagious as well. And, and when we are supposed to do something about it, we tend to withdraw and conform because we fear, you know, like, like, like being rejected. So, yeah. I mean, like that's a collective fuck up. It's an individual fuck up. And facing that reality is extremely, extremely disturbing at all levels, right? Mm. And what it is going to bring out, it's going to bring out or unresolved collective traumas and individual traumas, or primal fears, and or limiting and destructive beliefs. Mm. And so that's a big one, right? And I understand <laughs> why, why, why denial is, is there. And to some point, we need to have it a little bit, because if we were to accept it as it is at once, it's likely that we would have a collective insanity, you know, yeah. like a collective decompensation. And that would be like, that would be, more dangerous. Yeah. So we got to slowly help each other out of denial, you know, softly as compassionate, conscious human beings so that we can face reality as it is and so that we can start to make the changes that we need to make in order to overcome the challenges that are presented to us. Mm. And, and that's mandatory. But the first probably to overcome this challenge of denial is to recognize that it's there. Yes. And, and without being, you know, without being dramatic about it or without being emotional about it, just recognizing that, okay, it has a purpose. Like what was being asked from us is a profound transformation mm-hmm. and, and, and making that transformation too quickly can lead someone to the psychiatric world. I mean, I personally, that's my journey, right? <laughs> uh, so I understand, you know, that we need to go slowly with that, right? Because yeah. I made it out, I made it through, but many people get stuck, right? Yeah. And so you don't want to be in that position. Mm-hmm. So we need to slowly help each other out with compassion, with, with, with knowledge, with consciousness, with sense-making, out of this stage of denial, and, and so that we can make the transition, you know, that we are in need to make in order to have a future mm. on this planet, you know? And so there's, it's really, so probably what I want to add here is that there's an interconnection between, you know, the need, the collective need for introspection and actualization, yeah. the healing of traumas, the entrance, uh, recognizing the entrance in the proposing, taking our creative power and stepping out of denial. This is not separated process. They yeah. are one and the same because 
getting out of denial is being confronted with, again, our traumatic memories. Mm. It's being confronted with our deepest fear. It's being confronted with our historical reality of abuse, you know, mm. notably how, particularly us for Western people, how our culture conquered, dominated, and exploited the rest of the world. Totally. You know, and, you know, from colonialism to slavery to neocolonialism, just an anecdote, you know, to say, when I speak about denial, right, yeah. is that I'm sorry for people who are from the US, please, this is not a personal attack to you, but it's just an example. My country, France, has many others, but this one is just quite ironic, mm. right? If you think of it in history, like USA was a voice against colonialism <laughs> and, you know, uh, promoting uh, uh, people, freedom, or, you know, uh, um, yeah. And but if you think of it, what is the U.S. is a country? It, it it has done worse than colonialism. Yeah, it's migrants that came, conquered the land, destroyed the native culture, and separated from where they came from. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is not colonialism anymore. This is theft. It is as if the European colonialists mm-hmm. had conquered Africa, wiped out the African, and claim uh, cl- cl- Africa as their land. Yeah. And then saying, well, you know, and then claiming that those who are doing that in the U.S. are colonialists and saying, no, we are standing for freedom. <laughs> it's a joke, right? So <laughs> yeah. this is the type of this is the type of of cultural narrative that we've made to deal with some disturbing parts of reality that we're going to have to deal with yeah. in a compassionate way. Because the point is not to point fingers and say, no, who's the bad guy? We've we've all been bad, yeah. right? We've all been bad. We've all we've. Our ancestors have done, you know, what they could to survive and yeah. what they thought would be best for them, for their family, for their country. Mm-hmm. But now we have to come out of this logic and start to recognize, you know, our global reality, recognize that we are all on the same planet, that we are all part of the same species, all part of the same universe, and that right now it's time to enter a new game, you know, a game in which we can trust each other in which we can work together to create the future because the game in which we turn, we are against each other, you know, to dominate each other. It's just not sustainable. Mm. Yeah. So, yeah. So there's going to be, there's, there's, you see, it's a lot of work to do, <laughs> but it's the also exciting. That, yeah. Yes. It's exciting. And there's <laughs> yeah. really like, you know, like there's really so many things that can be done, you know? Yeah. So yeah. it's really up to each and everyone to, to choose what they really want to be, which role they want to take, yes. you know, what, what, what game they want to play and what legacy they want to live. Yes. Cause it's happening right now. You know, the game is on. Yeah. We don't know what's going to come out of it, but we are definitely invited to play it. And, and one thing, uh, human humanity has shown over the, the epochs is we're incredibly adaptive and we're incredibly creative. And when we have a major problem right in front of us, we've stepped up to the plate every time. And right now it is our time of reckoning. We need a wholesale phase shift upwards in consciousness right now in order to overcome these issues. But I believe we're up to the task. And let, just like you said, taking responsibility, not from a, a place of shame or, or judgment, but taking responsibility, recognizing denial, recognizing trauma, becoming more aware, be, uh, doing your personal work. These are things we can all do right now. And if we're doing this at scale, we can change literally overnight and we can overcome our major problems. So Benjamin Castillo, this has been absolutely fabulous. Thank you so much for sharing your time, your wisdom, your magic. How can um, how can people who want to support you reach out? New World Together is your institution or your your initiative. How can people support you? Um, well, you know, you can you can find our, our email on the website. Uh, just know that if you connect on the website right now, uh, we are re-updating it. So the version that you'll find is the two years and a half old version. Not really telling what we do, but you're still gonna find some cool stuff. If you're interested in the subject and you will find our contact there we we i mean we are still welcoming any type of collaboration i mean we understand that i mean alone no one is gonna be able to make it we're gonna have to do this together yes and, and the sooner we come together the better yes um so so yes and and you know as you say you know we've we've i just want to add that you know like like yes we are facing great challenges but it's also such a great opportunity for evolution you know, absolutely for, conscious evolution so we really have to see the opportunity that we have you know to solve a lot of the problems that we've left behind and to create something new and magical together 
It's mm-hmm. gonna take it's gonna take you know a lot of inner work, mm-hmm. individual and collective shadow work, but it's definitely worth engaging into it because wow, the potential is just amazing, amazing, amazing. and it's so so rewarding, so rewarding. Yes. I, I think it's yes. an incredibly exciting time to be alive, even though we're facing some major problems. Like there's there's no other time in the history of humanity I'd rather be alive. And frankly, I believe that all of us are alive at this moment to facilitate this conscious awakening. Right. And so if you you shift your mindset away from doom and gloom into positivity or potential, this is incredibly exciting. We have the potential to create a world that is more beautiful, more abundant for everybody on the planet and have a lifestyle that is better than ever, like by exponential orders of magnitude than we've ever lived in the past. So, yes, I am incredibly hopeful. And thank you so much, Benjamin. I really appreciate you. you sharing your time today, brother. Thank, thank you, Pratik. Thank you for, for welcoming me here and for you know sharing this important message. And thank for the great work you're doing, man. I mean, you know, like that's yeah. That's, you know, we might be in a completely different part of the world, but you know, like uh, it's, it's the same. It's the same mission. You know? Yeah, and, and this and, is this is what it's all about. You do the personal work, and then you find your tribe. You find other people yeah. who are on the same mission, and you start working together. And this is how we build from the bottom up. So yeah, this is amazing. Absolutely fabulous Absolutely. to meet you. I'm sure we'll be in touch more, and we'll talk to you real soon. Definitely. All right, thank Benjamin. You, thank you. Have a great day, man. You too, bye. Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in. And if you enjoyed the show, please do subscribe, rate, and review. For more information and show notes, head on over to being-podcast.com. We'll see you next time. And remember, live your peace.